All right, in three, two, one, action. All right, so we're here sitting here with uh, Danielle Holcher, uh, who is a registered clinical counselor and the founder of Skylar Counseling Clinic here in Vancouver. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. Of course, uh, we've already had a conversation already, but I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about your background, not just in the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is in domestic violence, but also just your general background, please. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So my love for counseling started off in my undergrad, actually, in neuroscience, um, and I wasn't having too good of a time, and I reached out to a counselor, and it was not a very good experience. So I, I think from that really... Um, have this love and passion for you know fighting mental health stigma for providing good counseling services and ensuring that other people don't have an experience like that um, during that time I just wanted to be surrounded by kindness and warmth and so I started working at a crisis line here in Vancouver for sexual assault and it was lovely it really opened my eyes to what's like really uh, good quality support looks like and um, from there it just my career kind of took off I started working uh, with the police with victim services um, and then I did my master's in counseling psychology where I actually uh, worked a bit in India uh, as a couples mm -hmm. counselor for arranged marriages that oh, wow. um, had extreme domestic abuse in them so um, and then fast forward coming back to Vancouver I worked for the health authority and substance use and addictions so there was a lot of domestic violence integrated in that as well and that led me to here, to Skylark in private practice and seeing all sorts of clients and populations and helping people with uh, different concerns and work with a team of amazing counselors. So, yeah. Right. So what led you to India? So that's that's yeah. kind of like out of the blue. It's really cool that yeah. you were originally in Canada and then yeah. you moved your way to India and yeah. then you came back here. Like, yes. What was the reason behind that? Yeah, I think I wanted, you know, an experience that was so different from growing up in the Okanagan, growing up here in BC. Um, and it just the culture, I thought, really spoke to me. So uh, the people there were so lovely and warm and welcoming. And uh, there was an opportunity for uh, supporting a team there and I just kind of jumped on it and uh, yeah the rest is history so that's pretty wonderful that's yeah. awesome so um we will start jumping into talking about domestic violence as well so um again this is not an easy topic to talk about so um we want to make sure that we um stay sensitive like toward um people who may be like you know going through this right now um mm -hmm. so we'll start with domestic violence in terms of different types so um in your professional experience mm -hmm. um what are the different types of domestic violence other than just physical violence yeah yeah absolutely so there's physical there's emotional there's sexual there's financial um, there's verbal so those and physical as well like you mentioned so those encompass uh, all the types of domestic violence so speaking of verbal as well so yeah. you mentioned verbal so yeah. that's the part that always confuses me here so yeah. from what I understand is that there's a difference between healthy conflict versus verbal abuse but we know that you know not everything has to be categorized into something like verbal abuse so mm. what is the line between let's yeah. say verbal abuse and healthy conflict yeah that's a great question abuse is a destructive pattern of maltreatment so if someone loses their temper once and says the wrong thing like you say it's we all make mistakes um, that's conflict uh, it might not be ideal healthy conflict but I think the concern is where it starts to disintegrate one's identity um, or someone's needs so it really is more profound long term um, and usually with domestic violence it's not just one type so it might be emotional and verbal and physical all at the same time or all at different times so they, they really overlap in that way right okay so it's not just one thing just because somebody said this once yeah. it wouldn't be considered a verbal abuse necessarily but yeah. if the pattern continues over and over yeah. it could potentially be labeled as domestic violence or even verbal abuse yeah exactly, exactly. okay Thank you. Um, we also want to ask a little bit in terms of, so what are some common myths about domestic violence? And the reason why I ask this is because, again, like in my mind, domestic violence is caused by a male figure toward a female figure. And I'd like to ask, is that always true? And if not, like what are some different 
common myths that people may have about domestic violence? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the main myths that I hear a lot is that, like you say, it's a certain type of population, right. and that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, it's everyone, could be anybody uh, at different times, um, different days, different months, uh, and, and so I really think that's what makes it tough to define, is because there is yeah. such a diversity of folks that are impacted by it. Yeah. Um, some of the myths, like you highlighted, are that, you know, it's always men, again, not the case, um, you know, or that there's uh, nothing that we can do about it, um, or that there, you know, people can't change. I hear that a lot. Um, so there's often like ageist beliefs as well that if you know people are older or younger or there's children involved, like all of that, it, it's really um, specific. I think case by case. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we shouldn't. We should never just assume that it should be just one person doing it to another. Where it's yeah. it shouldn't be a stereotype. A stereotype, basically. Exactly. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to ask a little bit more about, you were saying something about change. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy, in my opinion, to demonize one person and label them as he's an abuser, he's an evil person, or they're an evil, evil person. So um, I'd like to ask a little bit more about that. Is it true that we can label someone as um, he's an abuser and there's no room for change? Or in your professional experience, do you think there may be room for improvement, especially if they have Mm -hmm. like shame and guilt about Mm -hmm. what they have gone through? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I I have had clients that are, you know, 60 plus, uh, a 90 year old client Mm -hmm. actually. Oh, wow. um, and people that wanted support with uh, substance use, for example. So they perhaps were drinking a lot their whole entire life, and at a certain point in time, they're they're just done and they want to change. And so I really do believe that at any time, people can reach out um, and make huge, huge changes in their life. So yeah. How long does that usually take? Because I feel like it's not like a one day, yeah. like I'm all of a sudden a better person yeah. all of a sudden, but yeah. rather yeah. it doesn't sound like an easy process. How does it like usually yeah. work? Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes it could be uh, stemming from an event. Um, So if... You know, the police are involved, somebody might really kind of have their eyes opened mm-hmm. um, and change change overnight in that way. But I would say the majority of time, it is it is a process. Uh, we all make mistakes, and especially if we have a certain pattern in our mind um, or difficulty with emotional regulation, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to learn new coping skills and strategies. So uh, it, again, it depends per person, but I think, it, honestly, it, if there's, there's a well, there's a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of different coping methods, is it mm-hmm. always recommended that people who want to improve themselves mm-hmm. always seek the help of a mental health care professional? Mm-hmm. Or is this something that they can be doing without the help of a mental health care professional? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it depends on the person, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, there, there are people that I, I think the benefit of the internet these days, you know, you can find so much online. Absolutely, yeah. You know, with social media and just really kind of deep diving into some of the resources available, I think where counseling comes into play is it makes that process more efficient. Ah, of course, yes. So people might be able to get from A to B by themselves, but with a mental health professional that kind of knows the way, yeah. it just makes it so much easier and often like less isolating or lonely. Hmm. Um, and it's always nice just to have kind of this neutral opinion where, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, I, I'm, I, I, this does make sense or I should be doing this or yeah, I do need to take accountability for that. So I yeah. think it really helps. Well, I'd like to ask a little bit about that. So in terms of resources, yeah. what do you think is a great free resource that people can use? And the reason why I ask is this, if I have like, let's say a cough and I go online yeah. already, like the website diagnoses <laughs> me, you have Ebola or yeah. like something like that, right? So that's the last thing that I would want. Yeah. So do you have any like free resources, like any, know of any free resources that people can use yes. to seek help whenever they want to in this, yeah. case, in this case? Absolutely. I think it depends on location. So here in Vancouver, like I mentioned, there's uh, Women Against Violence Against Women. They have an amazing crisis line. Um, often just Googling support resources for domestic violence in your community. Um, UBC, a lot of the universities, uh, UBC, SFU, Western Uni, they have webinars on domestic violence that are free. So if you're curious of a little bit deeper or more about it, or if it applies to you or your friend, uh, you can do research that way as well. Um, yeah, as, as well, there's also the uh, Ending Violence Association of Canada. And their website is beautiful with all sorts of resources just kind of uh, across Canada. So, yeah. Awesome. So I'd like to ask about 
just the current system that mm -hmm. is set up for people with domestic violence. So, yeah. so this is a little bit more of kind of like your opinion on. So, with the current system yeah. that they have set up uh, in, in this country, or not just in this country, but uh, um, but I'd like to ask if you could change something about the w the current the way the current system runs in helping people like this. Yeah. Is, like, what would you change personally? Oh, that's a great question. I would say, what would I change? more accessibility. Um, so again, as I was mentioning uh, on the internet, there's so many resources, but I, I love in person, you know, mm. where you can just walk into a certain yeah, organization. Um, and I think just uh, more people knowing about it. So more discussions like this where, you know, we, we talk about it and we fight shame and stigma surrounding domestic violence and, and providing more facts and discussion around like what to do, who to talk to, that kind of thing so that's what sort of change thank you i think you mentioned a very really important point about accessibility unfortunately mm -hmm. in the world where that we live today we always feel like la accessibility is always lacking mm -hmm. right and um so it's yeah. something that hopefully yeah. um we can improve our system upon i think it's definitely something that we can definitely mm -hmm. improve upon and um so i'd like to um veer the question a little bit toward a little bit of scenario so um i'd like to try to present like several different scenarios that i can think of in terms of kind of like who might be facing or who might be witnessing um mm -hmm. domestic violence so mm -hmm. the first scenario that i'd like to present is let's say i'm a high school student okay. or, or a grade school student and let's say i can see that my or I'm, I'm suspecting that my friend or class, classmate yeah. is being physically abused. Yeah. Now, they didn't explicitly say it, mm -hmm. but I can see, let's say, bruises. Mm -hmm. Or let's say I can see physical yeah. evidence as that leads me to believe that there may be, uh, there may be domestic violence. Yeah. But I'm afraid to approach mm -hmm. because I'm a, I don't want to assume anything, yeah. but I want to make sure that I help this person. Yeah. What can I do yeah. as a student, as a friend or a classmate? Yeah, absolutely. I think reaching out to the school guidance counselor mm -hmm. they have a lot of resources teachers again with their training are amazing in terms of linking people uh, and knowing like the steps of, of what to do if there is concerns like that talking to parents caregivers any sort of adult figure i think that can support and direct towards resources um, i think as well again the internet is an amazing resource so googling how to how to help a friend what to say what not to say those sorts of things but i think the primary piece is it takes a village so inviting other people in, um, again, two brains are better than one, so five brains are better than two, you know? So I think the more people, the better. So is it better, even if I'm just suspecting it, is it mm -hmm. better to speak up about it or is mm -hmm. it better to just wait? Like, mm -hmm. w which one would you think is more, like, wise to do? Is it yeah. better to speak up and, like, right away do something about it or is it better mm -hmm. to wait to make sure that something is happening. I see what you mean. Yeah, I think it's it's better to speak up, you know, it, to a person that you trust. So someone that is not going to tell the whole school yeah, or absolutely. you know really like harm the person that you're concerned about, um, because we we never know, right? Like you yeah. say, if there's bruises, it could be from soccer practice or something yes. else. But if you are seeing multiple multiple variables and it just it's not adding up, or you're worried about your friend. Absolutely. I think um, kind of pulling in an adult figure to have another set of eyes to look at the situation is really helpful. Yeah. And I think the word trust, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. is very important because I've yeah. seen many people, they would tell somebody else, but then mm -hmm. the person that they told they told that information to doesn't know exactly how to handle it, yeah. basically. So yeah. and, like, and that's caused yeah. all sorts of problems. As a former teacher myself, as yeah. I've seen um, things like yeah. that happen. So yeah. thank you so much for mentioning the trust yeah. piece. So yeah. I'd like to move on to the second story. Scenario, sure. which is um, probably in the workplace. Let's say mm -hmm. I'm an adult in the workplace okay. and I'm seeing that, well, the coworker or friend that I have, it's clear to me that there are signs of domestic violence, mm. let's say. And you and I and I tell them that it's that this is domestic violence. They mm -hmm. need to do something about it. But mm -hmm. the friend keeps saying it's okay mm -hmm. and continues to say, oh, it's okay. It's probably just my fault or mm -hmm. something like that, which happens a, a lot more often than people may yeah. realize. So yeah. in cases like this, how can we help someone who may be saying, well, 
I'm not going through domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that there are certain signs of it. Mm, I see. I think really supporting this person with a non-judgmental framework. Um, I think a lot of us, we're very protective by nature as human yes, creatures. Absolutely. Um, and we want to fix and we want to save. And we want them to break up with this person. Yeah. Or, you know, really kind of change their situation. And I think when we start pushing people in a certain direction, that's when they don't like to be pushed and they get defensive. Yes or you know they they start kind of muting their conversations or changing their story so i think if we can just be curious about um a person's circumstance and ask them you know hey how can i help you or you know like what happened last night you know I, i'm here to listen i'm here to support you in any way that i can just really being empathic and compassionate as opposed to um, kind of labeling it for them, like saying something like, oh, you know, that's really horrible. You need to do this. You need to do that. I think when we start getting too prescriptive or directive with with folks that that aren't ready to hear that yet, um, it, it might guide them in the wrong direction. Right. Okay. So as difficult as it may be, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of patience, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's important to, you know, to highlight that, yeah, like that's, that's not normal, you know, and, and normal is, is such a loaded word. And, but I think with domestic violence within households, it is very normalized and people get used to it and yeah, it, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But I think when a friend says, you know, I, I'm concerned about you, you know, uh, you seem, and, and just labeling observations like you seem really quiet these days or I haven't yeah. seen you at social gatherings very much or you know you, you seem really upset every day at work those sorts of things I think can be really helpful to draw awareness to the person of like what's what's really going on here yeah absolutely um because it's it all, always hurts to see when a family member or a friend yeah going through something like that and you know something's wrong you know something is up and you want to do something about it but Absolutely. I feel like as you were mentioning if we're so adamant about helping them then sometimes it pushes people away Absolutely. and it makes them even more sheltered yeah. in that place so yeah. I think what you mentioned is actually very very important which is very difficult for us to do right because yeah. we want to do something about it right away we want them to be okay yeah. but thank you so much for mentioning that and coming from a very compassionate place if you will yeah, um, yeah. yeah absolutely and I think you know normalizing resources too like yeah. counseling like if you've had a personal counseling experience describing that yeah. um, you know being able to name resources in the community like oh I heard this organization is really great or this crisis line is really great or even uh, testing out resources for people so calling the crisis line as a friend and just inquiring and saying like oh yeah I called them you know a few weeks back and they're really warm and friendly pieces like that just remove the fear and barriers for people when they're maybe thinking about reaching out to a resource but not sure what to expect right so i want to talk to you a little bit about um kind of like reaching out for resources yeah. uh, you were mentioning yeah. about um reaching out for counseling i yeah. believe that there's still stigmas against yeah. counseling which yeah. again this is it's kind of like if i break my arm people say go to the hospital yeah. but if i'm mentally ill yeah. people don't say well let's yeah. go to the hospital yeah. people say you're fine yes. so yeah. what kind of stigmas are there um when it comes to counseling um mm -hmm. including uh, this is generally as well as for domestic violence yeah. and what are some stigmas as well as like what how can you can you speak a little more about like kind of like breaking out of those stigmas mm -hmm. a little bit kind of like what are the stigmas and yeah. how can we make sure that this stigma is not true yeah. for people who are um, considering it basically yeah absolutely I think you know when it comes to stigma around mental health you're right it is absolutely there and you know it's with the internet and particularly with COVID actually it's becoming more and more normalized to talk about um, but I think you know we do have to choose our audiences so for example if we're in a workplace where it's not safe to disclose we have anxiety depression PTSD whatever it is um, and then there's other workplaces where it is really safe uh, so it's really kind of a assessing for yourself how you feel and it's okay to put a foot in the door technique you know like asking someone like yeah have you ever been to counseling before right. you know and see what they say and if they're like oh never that would, I would never do that it sounds horrible like then it's okay so you know your audience a little bit more there um, or as if somebody's like yeah I really heard great things about counseling you know again that that person is probably going to be warm and approachable with that dialogue yeah. so um, yeah 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 I really hope that a lot of people heard that because it's important for us to know that 
It's not a bad thing. The、mm-hmm. counseling is actually a very, very open and approachable way,、yeah. and hopefully, the stigma is, I guess, broken. Like through、yes. the through the talks that we have, so that and、um, people can like approach counseling with, I guess, an open mind. Hopefully,、yeah. that's what we want. Yeah, absolutely, and and that it's it's not a place where you have to go and talk about something specific.、Sure. It really is client led. So if you want to talk about X Y Z, absolutely, and if you don't want to, absolutely. I think that's also a part of the stigma of counseling. Is that you know it's going to be awkward,、um, or I have a lot of clients say like, oh, I I don't know what I want to talk about, or the alternative like I have too many problems, I don't even know where to start. Right.、Yeah. Um, and I think that's our job as counselors is to guide people through that. The awkwardness is on us, you、yeah. know.、Uh, saying the right thing is on us,、um, and using the different techniques and styles like people, you know, you, they don't have to worry about that.、Um, I think finding a licensed counselor is really important because they check. Certain boxes with education and experience and ethics.、Um, so reaching out and and、um, you know doing your research with, with mental health and with counseling, I think is important as well. So yeah, thank you so much for that insight.、Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about. So this, I think this topic is a little more sensitive than the topic that we've been talking about, which、mm-hmm. is basically talking about people who are. Perpetrators of、mm. domestic violence.、Yeah. So again, as I was saying earlier, it's、yeah. very easy to just label people and say、mm. these people are evil. These people、mm. cannot be changed. But、yeah. of course, we want to come from a place of compassion.、Mm-hmm. And so, I'd like to ask:、um, How often are abusers themselves abused? Ah, that's a great question.、Um, the statistics vary on that one, but from my personal clinical experience, usually most of the time,、um, hurt people hurt people. So、hmm. those patterns come from somewhere, whether it's from parents way back when, or neighbors, or I think societally too. There's a lot of、um, violence that's accepted、uh, or normalized. So you know, th- these these patterns, these neural pathways are built on years and years and years.、It's It's not something that kind of automatically happens overnight. So I think, you know, for folks that are struggling with being、uh, with abusing themselves or you know not being in alignment with their values,、um, that again to reach out to a counselor, honestly, to talk about what what can I do to manage my anger? You know, what can I do to manage my substance use so I don't become the person that I don't want to be? So yeah. So how how common is substance abuse in domestic、yeah. violence? Is、yeah. it always that people who、um, are abusers、yeah. um, do they always have substance abuse issues,、yeah. or is it pretty common, or is it not so common? Yeah, yeah, it's it's common, but not always. Right.、Um, again, I, I think it looks very different. Like、um, like financial abuse looks very very different than verbal abuse, right? So、um, it really kind of is contingent on the specific type, or、um, you know, the fa- the family culture too as well. Now I'd like to change the conversation a little bit toward people who are abused,、uh, people who are abused、mm-hmm. in a domestic violence situation. So, how often is it that people who are being abused themselves、mm-hmm. don't realize that they actually are being abused?、Mm-hmm. And what can we do to help them realize it? So I think we spoke about it earlier a little bit, but、um, yeah. how often does it happen that they don't even realize that they're being actually going through this? Yeah, yeah, I think. Pretty often, you know, in terms of stages, stages of change, that there is a period of time, and it does vary person to person, where we struggle with denial, we struggle with again normalizing behaviors that shouldn't be normalized,、um, and it can be very overwhelming. And that's a protective instinct within our brains of like, okay, everything's fine, it's all good, it was just once, or it's just a rough six months, or it's just a rough year, or they're yeah struggling with alcohol and it's not really them. You know, there, there's all the reasons. In the world, why somebody can still have a heart of gold, but still act in ways that are destructive to other people. So、um, now I'd like to shift the conversation towards you as well. So where can we find you? Do you have like、uh, do you have in terms of social media and website? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's、uh, skylarkclinic.ca. You can email us、uh, connect at skylarkclinic.ca.、Uh, we have a whole team of people、um, that are dedicated to counselor、uh, match consultations. So matching people that call in with the right counselor. I know a lot of people struggle with myself included when I when I first started counseling of how do I know what's a good counselor, the right counselor for me. 
me. And I think, you know, having a counselor um, or a mental health professional support you in what to look for. Um, whether you want a straightforward counselor or a gentle counselor or a counselor that uses humor a lot of the time or uh, a male therapist, non-binary therapist, like there's so many choices. Um, and so ask, having uh, someone support you in those questions and directing you where to go, I think is really helpful. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Website, uh, email, uh, phone call to just Google Skylark Counseling in Vancouver and we'll pop up. Great. Yeah. And um, I as for the last question from me would mm -hmm. be, do you have a message that you would like for us to hear mm -hmm. about domestic violence? If you have a message that you would like to share with us, please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, just reaching out for support. Again, you know, there's there's so many people, I think, that struggle with domestic violence and abuse and they don't know where to go or they think they're the only ones, they think they're alone, um, and there's a sense of hopelessness and fear. Um, and I think, again, reaching out for support with with this is, is just so helpful and eye-opening in terms of like, okay, there's a whole other world out there, or, you know, my relationship can shift, or I can change, or there's stuff that we can actually do um, um, to make our quality of life better and be happier and feel safe in our homes. All right. So I'd like to switch the conversation over toward the audience. So um, our subscribers sent us a few questions that um, I believe are really good for our um, conversation today. So I'd like to start by asking. So at Noisy Jaden OO asks, how does uh, domestic violence affect the physical and mental capabilities of a person? That's a part one of the question. Mm, that's a great question. I think it dissolves our sense of worth over time. So, um, for example, uh, a lot of us grew up with cartoons where there was a little devil and a little uh, angel on our shoulder, and the angel's like, "Oh, you're so great, you're so awesome," and the devil's like, "Oh, you're not very good, you're stupid, you know, you're you're not going to amount to anything." And the way I, I I see it as a metaphor is that like if there's somebody telling us, you know, all the time or even multiple times a day over weeks, months, years, uh, we start to believe it, you know, where we're like, "Oh, I guess I I don't deserve this," or uh, or I just, rather I do deserve this or you know I'm not a very good partner or you know I, I, I don't have the capabilities to leave this relationship or this situation so I think it really builds over time and compounds um, and it, it, it kind of becomes harder and harder to recognize as us being sucked down you know um, in a like really stressful environment where um, we're, we feel scared and alone and, and not sure what to do. I'd like to ask a little more, more about the mental side that you were saying earlier. Yeah. So obviously with years of somebody, to, uh, maybe months or even years of yeah. somebody telling you a certain thing mm -hmm. and certainly that internalizes those beliefs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody is going through that, how do we help them break out of that yeah. internalized state? Yeah, absolutely. I think really uh, verbalizing how much you care about them. Uh, we're very verbal creatures and mm. even if the intention is there and it seems like totally obvious that we're their number one fan, I think explicitly saying the words like, I love you, you're awesome, you're great, um, you know, I really like this particular thing. Um, when I do couples counseling a lot, I talk about uh, compliments and how to give a compliment. Mm. Um, and really the main thing is like the more specific the better so for example if I call someone nice uh, it's very easy for me to challenge that in my head of like oh but I was mean yesterday and you know I, I did this thing six months ago or I'm not that good of a person and they just don't know me whereas if it's specific of like yeah it was really nice that you showed up for my birthday party last week or that you got me groceries or that you listened to me talk about my relationship last week on the phone um, it's pretty it's more difficult to argue internally with evidence evidence that's like, well, I guess I, I did actually call them or I did truly attend the birthday party. So it's a little bit more concrete. Right, because it's hard to challenge a comment like, I went to your birthday party, so, so thank you so much for that. So, yeah. so it's really hard to challenge that. Thank you for that insight. And the uh, second part of the question would be, how does the feeling of sadness and manipulation go away? Or like, does it go away or how do we cope with it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, I, I think emotions are tough. They're, they're typically on a spectrum. So, um, you know, with mild sadness, for example, distraction might work, right? If I'm feeling sad, I'm gonna watch Netflix or I'm gonna go for a walk or stay busy, um, kind of really dive into work. But I think when it starts to build and it becomes overwhelming where we're crying every day or, um, you know, we're not functioning at work or, you know, um, we are buying ketchup in the grocery aisle at the grocery store and that's totally 
totally overwhelming. Um, I think kind of looping in mental health support, whether it's your doctor or counselor, uh, there's medications available. Um, I think talking about it too is really important. So um, in our brain, uh, if we are in distress a lot of the time, so in fight, flight, freeze, in panic mode, um, or we're really, really upset, it's hard to think clearly. Uh, so talking about it brings it from the middle of our brain and fight, flight, freeze, to our prefrontal cortex behind our forehead where we can have executive decision making or logic or weighing the pros and cons of, yeah, I don't want to be in this situation anymore or I deserve better than this. So I think the more we talk about it with uh, loved ones or people that are safe, the better. So it's almost like calling out those internal thoughts as mm -hmm. well as things that we go through instead of just letting it brew. Yeah, exa exactly. Or even journaling, like writing it down, again, shifts it in areas of our brain. So it's just a different type of processing. Um, or even just talking to yourself uh, or to your plant or to your animal. Um, I, I think really just kind of verbalizing and finding the language is, is really important. And it, we can almost role play and rehearse with ourselves of like sharing our story, just with our bubble, you know, and then expanding that to the people that we feel safest with and then kind of expanding from there. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that insight. And um, I believe it was, this is uh, Zaddy Luthien asks, uh, what early warning signs can you look for when you first meet someone mm -hmm. to help you not fall for an abuser to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, probably number one is emotional difficulty with emotional regulation. Um, so if somebody loses their temper really quickly um, and it's directed towards someone or something, so towards an animal, um, if there's like kind of acts of violence, like throwing throwing a computer or hmm. throwing their phone um, or uh, like severe substance use. It's uh, often domestic violence is about a lack of control, a lack of self-control. So really looking for people's healthy coping. You know, do they have a routine that keeps them balanced? Um, are they happy? Do they journal? Do they talk to a mental health professional? And I think really it's, it's more so about looking for green flags as opposed to red ones. So what what does this person do to support their own mental health so when stuff goes sideways they have the coping tools and mechanisms to deal with it accordingly well so speaking of that i feel like in the beginning of relationships as people yeah. say this is when we see the best of each other yes. right yeah. and it's not just yeah. because we're masking it better yeah. but also i believe that you know our brains tell us how awesome this person is in the beginning and so we have tunnel vision yes. so usually how long do you think it takes yeah. for us to kind of like observe to make sure that this person does indeed have yeah. great coping coping mechanism mm -hmm. as you're mentioning yeah. like how long does that usually take in your opinion yeah that's a that's a really great question i think on Honestly, it's, it's dependent on life context. So for example, I might be um, healthily coping with my work, uh, with my relationship, um, but maybe I lose my job and maybe I start to drink more um, or maybe I get into a new relationship and this person is so infuriating and I just don't want to deal with them anymore. So I think those sorts of variables outside of ourselves also impact the way we handle stuff as well. So, you know, it's, it's we're as humans, always a work in progress right. you know and I think establishing our own lines and boundaries whether it's two weeks from now 10 years 20 years from now of just knowing like what is acceptable to me in a relationship what is acceptable to me in, in a house uh, on a domestic team so to speak and going from there yeah, I think that's always a very, very difficult part, honestly, yeah. because when you first start a relationship, yeah. you know, you only want the best for this person yeah. and it's very easy to yeah. be in denial. But yeah. um, I think it would be great that, you know, based on what you were saying, yeah. that people are able to make a better decision for themselves, hopefully yes. in the long run as well. Yeah. And so we're going to move on to another question by, let's see, Athena Baker 1829 asks, mm -hmm. how do you appropriately, appropriately, oh, let me try that again. How do you appropriately talk to kids about domestic violence, mm -hmm. either for preventative purposes Yep. or if you as a as a bystander feel that something is not right about mm -hmm this child's situation. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I think it's 
depending on the age, so like uh, I think we would talk to a six-year-old differently than a 15-year-old, for example. So uh, really from a young, young age, as young as possible, talking about consent, you know, um, and, and respectful behavior and what does respectful behavior look like. Uh, I think in certain families, respect looks like obedience. Um, respect looks like not swearing. Respect looks like talking to each other and uh, talking about emotions being okay. But again, it does, it does vary per household, right, and per family. So using words that the child at whatever age they're at would use. So a 15-year-old will have a lot broader um, verbal capacity than a six-year-old. And again, Google is amazing for this of, you know, what what are some typical phrases that I could say to explain to an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old? Um, and again, mental health professionals and physicians as well, actually, will be able to describe a little bit more of the developmental stages that kids are at. So, you know, whether they have abstract thinking, so kind of um, complexities outside of themselves or whether you know a, a younger kid is just so self-focused um, and they haven't really fully developed a, a sense of compassion yet so it might be more helpful to talk about uh, domestic violence um, just pertaining to themselves as opposed to somebody else does that make sense yeah so I wanted to ask a little more about so let's say you witness um, domestic violence and you want to um, help the child out or yeah. and then so let's say this yeah. child is involved in domestic violence yeah. um, what's a good way to because you, you want to make sure that yeah. you um, help this person but not also get I don't know like, this is kind of like um, it's a very sensitive topic yeah. right um, yeah, yeah, yeah. for someone that young how do how do you start how do you even start that conversation yeah yeah absolutely um, I think through the parents or caregivers mm -hmm. um, as an adult uh, here in Canada if you suspect any sort of child abuse or neglect um, we have we all have the duty to report it to the ministry so yes. Ministry of Child and Family Development so again their 24-hour line is amazing I've called that number myself and they're so supportive and they have the list of, a que of questions and evaluations and assessments and they're experts in that so again if it's like oh I'm, I'm not really sure like when in doubt just call and you can ask questions for yourself and get more information there's again like so many variables and, it, and it's so tough and I think for for most children it's just it's so complicated and it's so hard to understand that really the onus falls on the adults surrounding these kids right so whether it's family community teachers again any sort of authority figure um, um, looping in more support and experts in domestic violence so uh, there can be all hands on deck so to speak and I like to ask a little more in terms of um, educational context yeah. and let's say I am running a class yeah. on domestic violence yeah. and, and again again this is not suspecting somebody ha who yeah. has domestic violence but rather for yeah. educational purposes I'm yeah. running the class and yeah. let's say we need to talk about domestic violence yeah. in, in the classroom yeah. like how would you go about or what would you advise um, that teachers consider mm -hmm. when we are talking about domestic violence to little kids yeah absolutely I think talking about a safety plan uh, that's one term that counselors use a lot of like okay what to do if so if a child reports um, you know that mom and dad or parents are arguing about a certain topic and they're yelling what is that little kid gonna do um, or who can they call or where can they go um, or if there's a kind of sibling conflict you know how what do you say to mom and dad or what do you say to you know the the parents or the uh, the authority figures of the household. So I, I think again, practicing and role playing with them. So verbally saying it, um, or who who can you tell? Like, oh, you can tell your teacher, or you can go to counseling about it in the school. Just really linking them to resources, I think, is important as well. Yeah, excellent. So then we'll go to question number five. So uh, Kevin Influence asks, what are the best ways to help someone who is willingly refusing to leave an abusive domestic partnership, which we already touched upon, but I would still ask, like to ask yeah. anyway. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I think, again, coming at it from a, from an empathic standpoint. So often uh, we're taught that empathy is treat others how uh, we want to be treated, um, but true empathy is treat others 
others how they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. So if they are wanting space and they don't want to talk about it, then they don't want to talk about it. Um, if they're experiencing domestic violence, chances are their boundaries are non-existent or very few and far between in the household. So if they're str struggling with feeling heard and seen, um, it's our job to provide a safe space. It's not our job as friends and support to fix them or direct them in a certain direction. It literally is just like, hey, I'm here to talk if you want. Um, you know, I see you, I hear you, you're awesome no matter what, and what can we do about this? And if they're not at that place yet, then it's just an open conversation. So again, I think for a lot of people, like it's, it's challenging to know like where the line is you know like what's acceptable what's unacceptable and i think for a lot of folks the line shifts so um as support and as help we can also help identify those lines of okay so last week you know or six months ago you said um that you didn't want to tolerate swearing in your relationship and now i'm hearing that like there's a lot of um verbalized uh swearing or uh kind of name calling and I'm just curious, like, how, how are you feeling with that? Um, or what can I do to help support you with that? Okay, so we'll continue with question number six. AC Knight asks, how do you set firm boundaries with others in domestic violence? Mm, that's a, another really great question. I think... Um, it's a phased approach. So for example, if I, if someone does something that I'm not comfortable with and I say, pretty please, can you please stop? Um, and they listen, great, beautiful. Um, if someone, uh, if I set a boundary with someone and say, hey, like, would you, would you mind speaking to me in this way or lowering your voice um, and they don't listen, you know, we're kind of put in between a rock and a hard place of do I increase my voice um, to kind of overpower theirs or do I just take a step back? Um, and I think the majority of the time, if somebody is not listening to your boundaries, chances are they're in fight, flight, freeze. They're not thinking clearly. And just to say, OK, you know, um, I'm just going to leave the room or I'm just going to leave the house. I'm just going to go for a drive and remove yourself. So we can use our words to the best of our capability you know, being respectful, polite language with, with boundary setting. Um, and at the same time, if somebody doesn't listen, they don't listen. And we can't, um, we, we can verbalize our boundary, but can't force them to not do X, Y, Z. So really it's about what can I do in my bubble or what's my responsibility in terms of keeping myself uh, emotionally and physically safe. And when you do so set, uh, do set those boundaries, yeah. and what can you do if the people that we're working with don't respect such boundaries? How yes. can like what, what what are some next steps that people can take? Yeah, yeah. I think again, creating a safety plan. Like, okay, if this person's not listening to what I'm saying, I'm going to go over to this friend's house, oh, okay. um, or I'm going to let them do their thing, however they cope, um, and I'm going to re-engage in this conversation tomorrow when things are more calm. Um, and I think again, really taking a moment to think and pause with whatever behavior is happening on your end of things uh, like will this lead me in the direction that I want this relationship to go so for a lot of people if somebody is uh, yelling and swearing at you for example to yell and swear back it kind of um, trigger ping pong like we kind of escalate each other so I think a lot of the time if, if someone's having a hard time or being abusive or is intoxicated or not thinking clearly for whatever reason um, it's really just kind of taking a step back and uh, protecting ourselves in that way so the second question yeah. that the same person asked was do perpetrators really love their partners slash victims or mm -hmm. Is it just not there? Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting question. I love that. I, you know, that's something I think about a lot, and a lot of clients ask me is what is the definition of love, and I think when we just um, define it as an emotion, uh, caring for someone, absolutely, people can uh, behave poorly or not in alignment with their values, um, and still care and want the, the best for the person. So there's a misalignment with their behaviors um, and what they, who they want to be essentially. Um, however, if we shift uh, the definition of love um, within like a healthy framework, for example, that, you know, if somebody has healthy love towards someone, they're going to treat them with respect. They're not going to hurt them. They're going to want the best for them. And I think that's the version of love that I tend to encourage people to go towards. A lot of us grew up in households where um, love was verbalizing, I love you, and then being disrespectful towards each other. So I think as we form our own relationships, 
you know, it's really on us to define what that relationship looks like and what we, what's appropriate to us or what's within our um, comfort and our happiness, I think. Great. So question number seven, uh, a day's Amanda asks, yeah. how does domestic violence affect children? Mm, absolutely. So much. So, so much. I think um, children are so vulnerable and their brains are forming and they're figuring out what's right and wrong and what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. So when we uh, like swear or yell in front of our kids or throw things, that teaches them that that's okay to do. Even if we don't explicitly verbalize it, um, it becomes normalized. So you might notice that um, a little one is starting to behave in similar ways to parents or caregivers. So I think, again, it's about healthy coping strategies. When we get angry, verbalize it and take a step back. Take a moment of pause, do what we need to do in order to like kind of re-ground ourselves. And if we can exhibit that behavior to the children around us and teach them how to take a moment and just verbalize our feelings and breathe, then they will start to form healthy behaviors as well. The same person wanted to ask: Will they? Uh, will they? By me, they, I mean, our children. Yeah. Will children also cultivate the same kind of like domestic violence and instilled within them? Basically, cultivate yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're we're creatures that learn through role modeling. So if one behavior is deemed acceptable in a household, then. I think we all kind of learn from each other of like, okay, so that's that's what I do or what I say to get to where I want to go. So if pretty please doesn't work, if I scream and yell and throw things and then I get what I want, then you know I'm going to do that again. And we often accidentally positive rein- positively reinforce children um, when they do have a temper tantrum. We're like, okay, here, fine, just take it, take the iPad and go. Um, and that teaches them unconsciously that okay, so if they yell and scream, then they get the iPad. So they're more likely to do that again, as opposed to saying, okay, this is not a good time for the iPad right now. Just take a breath, sit down, um, and let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you're feeling. So if adults aren't conducting themselves in that way, then um, chances are kids are, they seem to hear everything in a house, you know, like kids are absorbing that information as well. Right. So is domestic violence ever the fault of the victim? Mm, I I love that question. Uh, Short answer, no. Um, Fault, I find, is divided into two different categories. One is accountability and one is responsibility. So absolutely, we all have the responsibility to look after ourselves, to protect ourselves, um, to define what emotional safety means to us. But if somebody uh, swears at me or hits me, that is that that is not on me. That's They're in charge of their own behavior and I am in charge of my behavior. So I can take a step back. Again, I can re- reach out to different resources, um, but at the end, of the day if someone's behaving poorly towards me regardless of what i do it's not my fault great and how does one find healing from domestic abuse and with Mm -hmm. that i'd like to also ask about you were speaking about children how Mm -hmm. does how do children who went through domestic violence Mm -hmm. um heal from domestic abuse as well Yeah. yeah yeah i think a big part of Um, anyone's experience is defining their story. So it's finding the words of like, okay, what what happened? What did they see? What did they hear? Going through all the senses. um, You know, when did it happen? And then how does it make them feel? Defining all the emotions and what can you do about it? Um, And I think, again, it it varies with the ages of kids and the ages of adults as well, or the, the past experience that adults have had. But I think really talking about it and brainstorming with someone of different ideas of, you know, journey or music, writing music often really helps people heal, um, or listening to music, or um, volunteering, you know, like volunteering at an organization to really like build our confidence, our self-worth, our sense of community. Um, domestic violence can be really, really isolating, where we feel really alone and really scared, so getting our needs met in different ways is important as well. Uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think that's something that you know, a lot of people may go through but don't know how to exactly navigate through because obviously when you go through something traumatic for a long time, it's so hard to navigate your emotions or navigate your life in general. So I think it's important that, you know, we find different ways to channel that, mm-hmm. if you will, to in terms of healing. And um, the last part that I wanted to ask about was about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, as someone who's also been through not domestic violence necessarily, but for someone been through someone who's been through abuse in general, mm-hmm. 
I found it personally very difficult to mm-hmm. find to find acceptance mm-hmm. slash forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So, um, in addition to the question that um, this person was asking. Mm-hmm. Is forgiveness something that could be achieved, or is is, is something that that should be encouraged, mm-hmm. or is acceptance like okay? Like is, is is that like just okay with just acceptance? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think with forgiveness, it, it's for ourselves. So if I carry that anger around for years and years and years, it it hurts me. Um, I often describe to people that we all have emotional backpacks and every negative event is a rock in the backpack uh, or challenging event. So big traumas are perhaps bigger boulders or things that kind of irritate us day to day, like with our job being frustrating, we just put these rocks in the backpack and it's weight, it's emotional weight and it makes us harder to navigate other experiences in our life. So really taking the rocks out of the backpack, taking a look at them and disintegrating them, throwing them away, whatever we want to do. And if that's forgiveness, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think uh, another piece that people question is, you know, is forgiveness the same as signing off on someone's behavior? Does it mean that it's acceptable? Absolutely not. There's a way to forgive and still keep distance, to, to keep your boundaries. Again, you know, whether you want a relationship or not with this person, there's different um different levels of closeness with the relationship so it could be a phone call once every six months it could be you know seeing someone once every five years and uh, if someone is in your life regularly that you need more space from I think you know finding ways to get that space if that's needed yeah I really hope a lot of people heard that because you know people who've been through abuse probably find it very difficult Mm -hmm. to forgive somebody and um as you said, I think it's very important that you mentioned that it's for ourselves, yeah. right? It's for our own recovery, and um, I really hope that by you know pe- by by listening to you, people will um, I guess find ways to learn how to accept what they've been through, but also learn how to forgive for themselves, so that, so that they can find recovery. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think too, like forgiveness is not. A particular moment in time it definitely is a journey and maybe you know this year I completely forgive person X but next year something comes up that's triggering for me or I start reliving certain experiences or ha- have new information and no nope, I don't forgive them anymore so it really ebbs and flows and it's healing is not linear so it's really kind of up and down and again forgiveness I think is subjective and it's um, yeah it can be defined differently in a good way Thank you so much for your time today, Danielle. Um, you are our, our favorite guest so far. <laughs> now, let's, cl- let's, let's clarify, you're the only guest we've had so far, but um, you have been amazing, and I'm sure that you're going to set an amazing standard for all the guests that are uh, coming from uh, this forth. So uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.